Hello, everybody. I'm Levi Litwe from Central European University, and I am talking to a good friend and colleague and co-author and collaborator and partner in crime, Bruno Castaño Silva uh, at the University of Cologne over there. Say hi. Hey. So, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about big data. As, uh, uh, as, the, as uh, So what's behind that catchword? Tell me. Um, so there's a lot, right? Uh, so first yeah. of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think this could be a pretty cool chat. Um, so basically, I think big data is one of those buzzwords that people start throwing around because it's cool and it gets you a lot of grant money and people get impressed by what you're doing, uh, like you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning and uh, and whatnot. Um, but there's some like if you can separate the weeds from the shaft, there is uh, there's something there. Uh, so I think why people get so excited about it is that for the past, I would say a decade or even like just for the past few years, um, there's just so much data that's available for us to do research in social sciences, which was not there before. Um, and it allows us to test theories that we were not able to test before, for example, or we were much more limited on how we could, uh, how we could test them. We have the possibility now of really expanding our knowledge on several different domains based on new data sets that have are being generated right now as we speak uh, which were not there before and i think that's why so, so many people are so excited about it uh, but there's so, definitely a lot of yeah yeah so so where where where's this all this new data come from like why didn't we have this before uh so i think there's two things one is that for example, a lot of the things that social uh, that we do with uh, with big data in social sciences comes with uh, social media data, right? Um, yeah. So it's pretty straightforward to like get a developer credential for the Twitter API, and then you just download all of the tweets from uh, mentioning a certain term or from a bunch of different accounts um, and all that. And so suddenly you have uh, you have all that. You can get access to Facebook data or to Instagram data, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, you name it, Wikipedia. Um, so this is all out there and we're able to get it right now. Um, the second thing is that we have a lot of archives that are being digitalized. So mm -hmm. you can get, for example, parliamentary speech data from a bunch of countries, which, you know, five years ago, you'd have to go to the actual parliament building, scan the PDFs one by one and read them because also our um, optical character recognition systems were terrible. So you couldn't even like extract text from it. And now we have very good OCR systems and we have all of this digitalized. Yeah, so a lot of computing and power. Just, and all. Yeah, exactly. We have computing power. Uh, we can just throw it on the cloud and we can run it. And it's much easier to handle huge data sets in relation to, yeah, five, 10 years ago. Yeah, but we shouldn't give the impression that uh, I suppose uh, it's all social media and parliamentary speech. I mean, there's 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 a lot of other things on the internet, uh, uh, even something as simple as as just web pages. <laughs> so we exactly. can look at what web pages that use a certain keyword uh, say. Uh, definitely, there's forum data. There's uh, there's I mean, you mentioned social media, but uh, there is. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about this in a second. But there's uh, relational data where we know who's tied to whom and social media would already be uh, in this in this group of data sets so so there's a lot there's a lot and uh, and every day there is so much more new data being produced all right so so like as compared to traditional statistical approaches like uh, how would we approach processing this massive amounts of uh, uh, of information um, so I think the first thing is that, um, let's say if you were to get your PhD in political science 10 years ago, um, and you would go through a statistics training and methods training, you'd learn how to work with uh, whatever survey data and you get some basic knowledge of like cleaning your data set and looking for your missing data and stuff like that. And this basic data manipulation. Um, and I think the biggest difference right now is that you need to get a pretty good uh, understanding of more advanced techniques for collecting the data and for processing it. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, to work with APIs that we mentioned, right? And it's not just social media, uh, as you said, there's APIs for a lot of different uh, data sources online. Um, it's more complicated than, you know, just opening a table, an Excel table in R, for example. Um, so there's the first, uh, there's the first difference is that data cleaning, data manipulation, 
like obtaining data is more complicated than it used to be. But once you get to the analysis, then it doesn't necessarily get more complicated. So sure, we can have text models um, that, well, something that we've had for, for a while, uh, we can have network models, uh, but sometimes you just want to, you know, get a measure of frequency of something and you do a t-test to see if, you know, one group talks about, more about a certain topic than the other. Um, so for the analysis is where we still have, an, and this is maybe where one of the problems comes from, I think we'll probably talk about it uh, later, is that there's a huge technical baggage that you need to have to be able to collect this data. Uh, but then for analyzing, you still have to pay attention to our basic understandings of statistics of you know hypothesis testing and causal inference and all of these things and some people forget about those and they're like here's this super cool data that i got this super cool network model and then you're like okay but you know from a theoretical perspective from a conceptual per conceptual perspective like you're not giving me much here like yeah um, <laughs> yeah so um but of course i mean i mean this comes with challenges like having so much information and analyzing so much information that that traditional statistics have not had to deal with and i think one of one of the one of the explanations of of why the analytical approaches are not that complicated is because we don't want to make it that complicated like yeah exactly. we, the the mass quantity of data makes 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 it complicated enough. So 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 that helps. Now computing power is is ever increasing, and it almost seems infinite at this point if you have enough money for it. Um, and it's not buying a big computer anymore like it used to be. It's 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 just a couple clicks of the button, and you can just rent uh, yeah. computing power. And, and 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 of course, these are also systems that we have to learn now. Uh, which uh, ten years ago, when I mean, <laughs> I was you said ten years ago, if you were learning statistics, well, yeah, you were learning statistics ten years ago from me. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose <laughs> roughly. So yeah, and okay. I didn't teach me. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, give or take a couple. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I and I didn't tell you how to use APIs, and I and in fact, you're the one telling me now how to use APIs. So, uh, I guess that's normal <laughs> in the progression of things. So, uh, so, um, so yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so it comes with the challenges of new tools, new, uh, uh, new, new problems as in uh, solving computer power. Some of that can be expensive sometimes, but, but they are not unreachable. Uh, you mentioned data collection. I mean, you, you, you say this API a lot. Uh, maybe we should tell people what it is. So the, do you know what the acronym is? Um, application Programming Interface. Yeah, so it's um, it's basically what it does is 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 whoever owns the data or has the data <laughs> gives you a way of accessing the data, which is quote unquote simple in in the sense that you know if you were on Twitter and you needed a tweet, that's not that easy to to find with the API. You can just make a, a couple simple queries and 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 pull the information out of there. But uh, sometimes they don't give you an API, and then what do you do? What do you do with big data <laughs> uh, problem uh, if you don't have an API? So the first thing that you would do is, uh, is web scraping, right? So web scraping mm -hmm. is when basically you write some sort of code to go through a lot of different web pages and download their content into something that is, uh, something that is useful. So for example, the, the, everyone who's learning web scraping starts with Wikipedia because they're the pages are all, um, they're all standardized and uh, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Like the HTML code is very simple, um, but let's say that you just wanted to get, you know, the list of every member of parliament for Italy for the last uh, 40 years. And these are in separate pages in Wikipedia and you could go and, you know, copy paste that into Excel and do that by hand and probably it's gonna take a while and you get a lot of errors because Excel. Um, or you can just write a couple lines of code in R, and then that immediately extracts that from those uh, from those pages and put it in, puts into a nice table that you can that you can use. You can also get associated information from those people, so visit their profiles and get like their birth year, the party they belong to, uh, where were they born, and all those things. So web scraping is this is one of the main options for collecting a lot of data. 
uh, from the internet. One limitation that we sometimes get into is simply how legal is it in some cases, right? So for example, Facebook is not exactly keen on sharing data. Um, so they used to have an API. I don't even know if it still works uh, for getting uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook data, but it's possible to sort of web scrape Facebook data, but there's legal battles on the, is this allowed or not within their terms of service. Um, and there's two views on it. And uh, I'm not sure which one would be, the, would be the most correct. Some people say, well, if I could manually click on these pages and copy paste this information into an Excel sheet, legally, there should be no difference from me doing that in relation to me just writing an R script that does that for me, um, even if it's much, much faster than I would ever be able to do. And there's some people who say, well, but you know, still you are sort of violating the terms of service that these data should not be processed or collected in this indiscriminate way because also sometimes you're collecting data from private citizens who are not even sure what kind of data is there available for you to do that. Uh, they don't give you any consent to say participate in your study. Uh, so there's a lot of debate as to well, how more ethical to do, but this would be one of the ways that you go into if you want to collect uh, a lot of data and they are not, not nice enough to give you an API where you can just go and say, please give me all tweets by all Italian members of parliament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, once we have collected the data through uh, easy means or not easy means, then uh, we're going to have to process this uh, data somehow. And I just made a list uh, based on uh, based on what um, courses we have. So that, that came to mind. So uh, social network analysis is, is one of them that is very much focused on the relational nature of the data. Um, who's connected to who. So think of Twitter, Facebook, who's talking to who, uh, what countries, I mean, that, that wouldn't be big data, but you know, what's the trade uh, uh, relation between two countries. So, so, um, so analysis of that is, is a pretty expansive field uh, that starts from simple things like visualizing all the way to how do you do inferential statistics with really complex structures like this? Uh, um does that sum it up is there anything to add <laughs> for social analysis yeah um i think SNA also one of the things is that it's already like you already have the data right they have quite strict recommend uh, requirements of your data has to look in a specific way it has to be in this specific matrix where this is a link to that um and then it's already moving towards the analysis towards the description and usually there the assumption is that just the descriptives give you something interesting or meaningful. Uh, so you can see how the people cluster across different groups as like ideological, uh, ideological measure or something. And there is, as you mentioned, like some inferential social network analysis. But my impression is that right now, a lot of what we see still in political science is very much uh, descriptive. It's like, hey, look, this pretty cool graph. These are, there are these people here on the far left, these people here on the far right. And we can get that based on how they retweet each other and stuff. Yeah, uh, there's text as well. So, and this is, I know this is something that you've, you've, you're kind of neck deep into uh, is, is analysis of text. So, uh, so tell me about that. So, uh, so analysis of text, uh, that is maybe one of the uh, most common because there's a lot we can do with text, right? Uh, and there's, so with text, like you start from the processing uh, in social network analysis, I guess like you need to have like the data set ready in a certain way for you to start analyzing. And with text, you just start with the, with the processing. So you get a bunch of uh, whatever, speeches, tweets, Facebook posts, you know, press releases, um, manifestos, pretty much anything these days that has some text in it can be, um, can be analyzed. And uh, you start with the basics like frequency, word frequencies, what are they talking about? Um, you move on to some more complicated descriptions, still like topic models. So what are the topics that these people are talking about? Um, if you get a bunch of speeches, what are the main, uh, what are the most common topics that the, that uh, these speeches are um, referring to? Then you can start moving to scaling. You have say speeches from parliament and you put, you manage to put them onto a scale to figure out where, which member of parliament sits on the left or on the right or government opposition. Um, and you move on with say sentiment analysis uh, with some other sorts of sem semantic analysis to see what kind of emotions are being expressed in those, uh, 
um, in those texts. So we have research, for example, on uh, government and opposition, uh, uh, how the sentiment varies, like negative, positive sentiment on speeches and communication by government and opposition parties, right? Um, and we see some interesting patterns, like in when we have a minority government in place, the opposition is more is nicer, so they're less negative when they're speaking in parliament. Uh, in relation to when you have a government with a majority uh, in parliament, and that's because in the minority government, you need to both sides need to talk for anything to get done. Uh, and this is one example of things that we couldn't really test before we had access to 200,000 parliamentary speeches and text analysis methods. Um, so these kind of things, and then you can also keep on going into natural language processing more uh, in the area of machine learning and using those texts to predict whatever you want to categorize them into different topics, into different speakers, into different parties um, to be able to uh, to categorize in, into different debates and so on. So there's a whole ladder of complication where you can go with text analysis from some simply counting words and what words are more frequent up to yeah, even recreating text if you want. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, AI and now you said the word machine learning. Let's talk about this a little bit more because this is an important component in this field. Uh, so what, what is that? Um, Oh, Some people by the say way, that you do teach a course on this at the Method School, so you're, you're the right I person to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, so some people would say it's a logistic regression with a much more grant money. Mm -hmm. um, but basically the idea of AI or machine learning, and you can use them interchangeably, is simply that you want to make predictions, right? Uh, so if we're talking about supervised learning, which is the most common way you have, is that you have a bunch of observations and you want to categorize them into, you want to put them into categories. So you know that some of these are, um, I'm struggling a bit with an example now, um, but let's just say you have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of political speeches, a, a paper that we're working on uh, together. So we have a yeah. bunch of uh, political speeches from parliament and then we know who spoke, right? We know if the speaker is a man or a woman and we're trying to train a model. So basically this is a statistical model that we run through all of those speeches and try to predict if each one of those was given by a man or a woman. And what this model is going to give us is basically um, a measure of how gendered is someone's communication. So if this model has a very easy time predicting these speeches were giving, given by a woman, it was actually a woman, uh, then this indicates that she has a uh, strongly, let's say gendered or female gendered communication while if you have someone like Angela Merkel and the model has a lot of trouble telling that she's a woman based on her speeches, this indicates that she has a much less gendered communication. So the idea of AI is you have categories that you want to categorize, uh, that you want to put your observations and you're trying to build a model to predict that. Um, now this applies to a lot of different areas. So you not only have like with text, but that will apply to image recognition, right? Um, so you want to categorize pictures into cats and dogs, or you want to say what objects are in this picture. So let's say you see Levy's background here and you want to throw it into the Google image labeling uh, system and it's going to tell you that there's a guitar and there's a clock and there's a pineapple and uh, something else. Um, there's no guitar actually, there's literally no guitar in the background. So just, <laughs> just say. No, I mean, that's a mandolin. That's, a, <laughs> that's a, I suppose that could be a tenor guitar, but yeah. Anyway, well, go on. <laughs> <laughs> you see where the source of uh, classification error comes from, right? Yes, absolutely. This is a big misconception. <laughs> like you can't even classify it, right? What do you want the machine to do? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but so these are, the, these are the things. And of course you can uh, now, most things are using some sort of AR system from Netflix recommending what movies you should watch to Amazon saying what you should buy and um, translation systems are all based on artificial intelligence uh, and all that. So, but basically the idea is you want to make a prediction. You want to generate a prediction based on new data. You use old data to try and train a model that will be able to do that accurately. And I, I guess this is somewhat of a, an opportunity for mixed methods. So the two of us, uh, Vidair and Jenny, are working uh, 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 working on uh, Kirk Hawkins' a coding of a lot of text 
for populism in this case. And, uh, and uh, that is like hardcore content analysis by humans uh, with broad judgments. And, and uh, so it's very, very qualitative work. But then one of the things that you did is, is, uh, is you went into, uh, you, you went and took those, uh, took those classifications done by people and tried to train the AI to, to do this. So, so it, there is opportunities for, for um, kind of mixing of, of qualitative and quantitative uh, research this way. Um, um, it still doesn't work, does it? There, any, any update on that? No. <laughs> oh, yeah so uh <laughs> yeah we've been struggling with this one for a while uh which i think is an important point that that um i have found big data projects incredibly frustrating because um because it's sort of like throw a bunch of information at the computer and let's try to pull out some patterns and then you end up like staring at it like what the hell is it saying <laughs> right it, it, isn't this part of the exercise it is. I think the, you're getting to a really important point there. It's like if you go to a big conference in political science and you go to the machine learning panels, you're going to see very bright minds spending telling you about how they train the most complicated artificial intelligence system in the world, then they can replicate the manifesto project scores for the party. Mm -hmm. and it's like, sure, I guess we're going to save a lot of money when we stop spending it on the manifesto people and coding it. But really, like, that's a lot of what is done right now is just people trying to identify the ideology of political parties to get as close as possible to the Chapel Hill data or to Manifesto Project. And that is just like, I, I feel like we could do more, right? If you look at other sciences, they're like decoding proteins and uh, doing self-driving cars and going to space. And we're here replicating the Manifesto Project. Um, doesn't seem like we're exploring this. Um, you're, you're not suggesting potential. that we should replace some politicians, uh, uh, country leaders uh, with AIs, should we? Uh, well, <laughs> I think we come from countries where we wouldn't mind if that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are from countries where we wouldn't mind and uh, lived in countries where we, well, I guess one is voted out of office right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, we think. He, he doesn't believe so yet, but anyway well this this is this is december uh 2020 just fyi so <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah yeah maybe we should be working on that but but you're right i mean very often very often the the we we end up wondering uh we end up wondering that that uh you know, what does this get us? It feels it feels like running a lot of laps to to not get so much and just be frustrated and and whatnot. Are there any questions? Like, do you have do you have a, you have an example or two of like good questions that this helped us with? Uh, definitely, that really helped so, us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So there's this recent paper by Pablo Barbera and colleagues at the APSR where mm -hmm. they got a lot of Twitter data from the US, from both uh, the public and uh, US members of Congress. And they're trying to see who influences whom. So mm -hmm. if it, is it that the public starts talking about something and then the members of Congress pick up on it and have their frames adjusted to respond to the public, or is it that politicians start talking about an issue and then their followers react to that? So basically there's the eternal question of where does public opinion come from? Is it influencing politicians or is are politicians driving public opinion? And this is something that we didn't really have good answers up to now. And they use this, uh, these pretty large Twitter data, they run the topic models on it, um, to find that basically politicians are responsive to the more extreme, in a way, or engaged members of their own parties. So they're not responsive to the overall public, but they're responsive to highly active activists on social media. And this is a really cool, interesting, important substantive finding, which we can do it right now because we have the data, um, but which was very was very elusive for a long time. Like what, who influences whom on public opinion? So there's definitely room for very good, um, well, theoretically informed, substantively informed uh, research that uses big data and that uses these methods. Um, I think the main thing there is that you might get to a point where 
the people who can run these models, they spend so much time learning these techniques, which are fairly advanced and very complicated that they maybe neglect a bit their theoretical training. And yeah. the people who have the theoretical training, like don't get into these because I don't know, this is too complicated for me, I don't get it. And we need to bring these two together. So we need to get both the people who can run all of these things and the people who can think of the important theoretical questions together in a room. And yeah, that's but, starting uh, to happen, but it doesn't happen that often. But there's nothing new here. Like I, I remember uh, in in the early to mid two thousands when I was in grad school, this conversation was going on about rational choice, and Definitely. and and we should we should get the mathematical modelers together with the with the, the formal modelers together with the empiricists because that's how we make progress. And uh, yeah, it was a decent endeavor, but uh, but uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so maybe it's just the stage we're at that in a few years we'll get more interesting things than you know more and more papers on measuring ideology hmm. yeah all right um one of the questions that came up in a recent uh, discussion i had with uh um we are uh, together working on a journal uh, uh that has a method section a methods and measurement section and in, in frontiers uh conundrum has decided to uh, to to venture into political science and we jumped on board um there was a discussion recently with uh, uh about uh potential big data projects coming in and uh one of one of our missions is is to promote mixed method research and 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 pluralism in, in methodological pluralism um is there room for allowing qualitative, systematic qualitative methodological work near big data projects. Because uh, one of the obvious possibilities that, uh, that came up, came to my mind is, is there's gonna be a lot of pattern seeking in, in the big mm -hmm. data and, and making sense of the patterns may be served well with qualitative uh, uh, augmentation if it's done if it's taken seriously and done systematically because I noticed that it's done very haphazardly uh, you mentioned topic models well what they look like is you get like a uh, like a blob of words and then you get another blob of words and you stare at it long enough then you get some meaning might come out of it yeah. but <laughs> but uh, but uh, um, yeah it, it doesn't seem like very systematic but it's definitely a qualitative exercise right yeah, absolutely yeah so i don't know do you see any avenues uh, uh, of moving forward here and i think it would be good actually uh, be a professional question for a journal but <laughs> i think it yeah. would be good i think it's definitely necessary um i think a lot of the coding that has to be done has to be done with some sort of qualitative like qualitatively informed like sure there's some concepts that we want to capture which are pretty straightforward like it's very easy to measure sentiment it's positive or negative um the populism which we want to capture and they are much more complicated to um to measure by a human and also by a, by an ai so having that is important uh having that for the interpretation like topic models like it's reading tea leaves sometimes like you get 40 topics which are just 40 <laughs> random lists of words and then you see immigrant in one of them it's like oh this is the right word um but so definitely there's also room for, and I think there's maybe some work that starts to be done to be like, how can we more substantively, um, substantively interpret these? Uh, though it would be good, of course, to have more the mixed methods, though I'm not sure how much these two crowds are mingling right now. Uh, it is still my impression that there's a lot of like separation and skepticism from side to side um, right now. So. Maybe there should be some events or some sort of research <laughs> program to try to approach uh, this. But right now, it feels like it is two quite separate, uh, separate groups that are not so keen on talking to each other. You have some data, big data people who are like, we have all the data, what else do we need? Um, yep. And then you have some people who are like, well, you have no idea what you're looking at, and you have no idea of the concepts, and I don't believe data anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, those are those are strong, and I think I think we're in a good position to bring some good people together. But we never talked about it until today, so um, I don't know. Is there anything we should add to this discussion? Um, 
don't know. I think uh, that we're fairly uh, positive. <laughs> I think the yeah. last time we talked about these things uh, at the winter school in February, probably more negative about uh, the whole big data thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think there's a positive development coming, and again, the data is there, and it's not better or worse necessarily than other data that we had been working with. We just have to figure out how to use it for answering interesting questions instead of uh, complaining yeah, about I it think... or thinking that the data itself is the answer. Yeah, I I I I I think uh, the the keyword there was uh, figuring out our questions because I I do sense that that's what that's what's going on a lot is is I got so much data here let's uh, let's uh, try to ask something with it yeah. <laughs> and and uh, th that kind of mentality is is not conducive to uh, good research outcomes though it, it it can be done and I think if like the causal inference uh, uh, world, which really does the, uh, how can I hack my independent variable? So it's awesome, uh, 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 but what are you trying to explain? Oh, that doesn't matter. Uh, that yeah. kind of mentality I mean, is, is- There's is, entire is, careers made on, I can find cool instruments and yeah, research it, that people hear and it's like, oh, this is cool. Like, theoretically, who cares? But, oh, this is very cool. So. Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, the, They've produced a lot of good research, so yeah. so maybe big data can as well, and yeah, as well, uh, and like there, there's something to be to 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 be learned there. So, yeah. all right, well, uh, thank you, Bruno, for talking with me about this. Yeah. Thanks, and for having me. Uh, and say bye to everybody. Bye, bye everyone. Take care.